Mary was sitting in the pantry. Today her stepmother had guests again, which meant that she would sit there until morning. Mary wasn't offended, she was even glad. When all those who came to her stepmother's house got drunk, Mary had no peace. They all tried to pinch her, tease her about life. Sometimes they even made her dance, and Mary loved to dance madly. Back then, when her father was with them, she went to the dance studio. But the girl didn't really want to dance in front of drunk people. Her father had married Mia five years before. For some reason, he decided that it would be bad for him and his daughter alone. Mary's life had been a living hell ever since, and before that they had a very happy family. Mary remembered how well they had lived before. Her mother had always baked a cake on the weekends. They had guests over, and it was fun. Papa loved Mama very much, and bought her flowers very often. And then, Mum got sick. For exactly a year, Mary and Dad took care of her. Dad took her to all the hospitals, but Mum died. When Mum died, Dad immediately turned grey. All night, all last night, he sat by Mother's side, holding her hand. He sent Mary off to bed, though she wanted to stay too. And in the morning, he woke her up and said, Mary, you're not going to school today. You will stay with a neighbour. Only after these words, the girl opened her eyes and looked at her father. And when she saw him, she screamed. At first, he didn't understand what was wrong with her. Then he looked at himself in the mirror. He understood everything and hugged Mary. Don't be frightened, my daughter. It's not a big deal. Until the funeral, her father never said another word. Not one word. He silently prepared everything, silently did everything. At the cemetery, he bent down to his mother. He stood like that for a while, then straightened up. Not a tear, nothing. Awake, a lot of people. Mum and Dad were always friendly and cheerful. A lot of people came to say goodbye to Mum, and when everyone left, Mary and her dad cleaned up the table. All the dishes were washed. Her father told her to go to bed. Mary obediently came out of the kitchen, but she did not go to bed. She stopped outside the kitchen door. Dad sat down at the table. He put a bottle of vodka in front of him, poured a glass to the brim. He drank it. He sat for a while, drank again. And then he put his head in his hands and cried. Mary was very scared. She never in her life thought that Daddy could sob like that. She ran to her room and hid under the covers. She fell asleep quickly, for it had been a hard day. When she woke up, her father was making her breakfast. Everything seemed to be as usual, except Mama was gone, and Daddy's hair was white. Mary was nine years old at the time. She felt badly about her mother's death, but she tried not to show it. She saw how hard it was for her father, but she went to work and did household chores. All this in silence. They stopped talking and laughing altogether. Everyone was afraid to say the wrong thing. Then a year later, Mary woke up to voices in the kitchen. She cautiously looked out of her room. Her father was sitting in the kitchen, a bottle of vodka on the table, and a bright red-haired woman was sitting on his lap. She was hugging Daddy, masterfully. Mary then jumped out of the room and threw herself at this woman with her fists. Get away! Get away from my Daddy! We have a mother! The woman shrieked and father grabbed Mary's hand and took her into the room. Stay here and don't come out. Mia will live with us. She will be your mother. I'm ashamed of you, you acting like a savage. Dad, I don't need a substitute. I only have one mother. Her father sighed and knelt down in front of her. Honey, 
You have to understand. I have business trips all the time and you're the only one at home, not counting the neighbor. When people find out about this, they'll send you to an orphanage. And Mia is normal and I like her. That's what I thought. The father went out and Mary was left crying in the room. Traitor, how could he? Mary came out of the room in the morning and immediately saw Mia. She was cooking something and father was sitting at the table smiling. Mary saw a bottle of beer in front of him. Dad, beer in the morning? Come on daughter, it's the day off. Mia gave me permission. Mia gave Mary an unkind look, but then her father turned to them and Mia smiled widely. Sit down, Mary. Let's have breakfast. Mary wanted to mutter something angry, but she changed her mind. She wasn't going to make a scene. It was her father's choice. She would just see less of this woman. It had only been two weeks since her father and Mia had been married. Her father left on another business trip and never came back. His car went over a cliff at breakneck speed. My father was pulled out alive. The money was urgently needed. This was the only thing that could give my father a chance. Mia must have loved her father after all. She found the money by approaching a local oligarch. There was a man in a small town who owed everything. Nobody really knew anything about him. They said he was some old man who hardly ever came out to people. Sometimes you'd see his car driving through town. There were never any cars like that in town. For some reason, everyone was afraid of him, even though no one had ever seen him. There were a lot of tell-tales about him. They thought he was almost a bluebeard in town. No one knew where he had come from in their town. But about seven or eight years ago, several buildings in the very centre of town were demolished, and then a huge castle-like cottage was built very quickly. Some said the man came here after some drama in his personal life, and some said that he was just the thug who had taken a well-deserved retirement. There was a bank in town that also belonged to this oligarch. It was there that Mia took a loan on some special terms. A neighbour told me that Mia went there firmly convinced that she would not get a loan. Or rather, to seem good to people she went there, knowing that she would be denied a loan. Mia would have lost nothing and her reputation would have been greatly enhanced. But she got the loan. Mia was very upset. Especially since the bank was aware of everything that had happened and offered to transfer the money immediately to the hospital account. The same neighbour said that Mia was nearly howled with rage. She had not expected such a turn of events. But there were too many people in the bank. People were watching her carefully. And if Mia refused the loan, they would stone her. Not literally, of course. But still... In fact, Mia had grand plans. She planned to sell their huge apartment in the centre in the future, especially since the town was growing and expanding. She wanted to do it with the help of the same oligarch who had built a hotel here, a ski lodge, and run a factory that had stood half destroyed for ten years. Her father had an operation, but it was not very successful. Her father survived, but one half of his body hardly worked. When he was discharged, Mary heard Mia yelling at him in the room, that because of him she now had a huge loan, that she would never pay it off, that he should send Mary to the streets or something else he could think of, but that he should pay for himself. My father kept quiet, and in the evening he and Mia got drunk. Well, to be more exact, her father was very weak, so Mia poured him a shot and he fell asleep. And she continued her fun, but in a different company, in a big room, with no one to be embarrassed. Her husband was discharged, why not have fun? That was the way it had been since that day. 
It is good if Mary has the time to feed her father before his loving wife brings him a glass, so that he sleeps and does not see too much. Otherwise, he starts screaming and falls out of bed. Mary had a hard time as well. She was in the way of Mia. In general, the girl felt that if it was not, then her father would have died very soon under mysterious circumstances. And then a strange thing happened. Mia had no money to pay the loan. She thought of something interesting. She brought to the house some young man in dark glasses. As Mary realized, he was some kind of loan officer or swindler. Mia gave him all her father's documents. The young man promised to take out a loan on him. He said they had a well-established system. This service cost exactly a third of the amount that could be taken. Mia agreed. She hoped to pay off her loan to get some more money. The young man did not cheat. He took out a loan on Mary's father. But they found out about it three months later, when people from the bank came to their house. Mia was furious. Not only had it all turned out this way, now they also had to restore father's documents, or else they would not get their allowance. There was practically no food in the house. Pasta, potatoes with rottenness from a sale, the cheapest vegetable oil. Mia blamed her father for everything. She yelled at him, sometimes even beat him. Mary was 13 years old at the time. Just after her birthday, her father died. He was the only family member for the girl. Mia's drunkenness became very frequent. The guests would change. Mia would get a good night's sleep, and the house would be full of fun again. Mary often missed school, and Mary's life in general became a nightmare. Mia, every time she saw the girl eating something, she didn't just reproach her, she even shouted at her. Allegedly because of their family now, she was afraid to go out in the street. And she could not sell the apartment because it was Mary's property and Mia was only a guardian. When people from the bank once again caught Mia drunk, they stayed in the house. The combined debt of father and Mia was such that Mia would never be able to pay it off anyway. The men in black suits were sitting in the kitchen, talking loudly about something, and waiting for the hostess to sleep it off. Mia woke up and went straight to the kitchen for a drink of water. She just entered and saw them. She wanted to run, but they caught her. The kitchen door was closed. The men were talking to Mia about something, and Mary did not know what. Mary was very scared. So scared that even her stomach was aching. The men left, and Mia sat in the kitchen for a long time. Then she came out to Mary and looked at her for a long time, and then said, Damn you, you're your father's brat. Why did I ever meet him? Mary cried and went into the storeroom as was her habit, and the next day Mia disappeared. She was gone for a week, and then she appeared. Turns out she wanted to go somewhere far away, but it did not work out. At some stop, the same guys from the bank took her off the train and brought her home. They advised her not to do anything stupid like that anymore. Mia stopped drinking alcohol and got a job. She became suspiciously affectionate to the girl. Mary didn't understand what the change was. What was this woman up to? But the fact that she was definitely up to something was immediately clear. One day Mia brought a strange woman into the house. She was so unusual, with short cropped hair, and her hair was multicoloured. She had a large travelling bag in her hands. She pulled out different beautiful dresses, and from a small suitcase the woman took out a camera. Mary watched these preparations spellbound. She had always liked everything to do with photography. And here, all the mysteries right in their apartment. Mia was so affectionate, so smiling. 
Mary, I was thinking, you don't have a single beautiful picture, and you're almost a big girl. We have to fix that. Kate will take some pictures, and we'll choose the best ones and make you a big picture in a frame. Mary looked at her in surprise. Why would she be so generous? But she was ready to be photographed. She understood she would be photographed in beautiful clothes. Mia was obliging. Every now and then she corrected Mary's long, loose hair. She asked her to touch up her lips a little. It was as if the girl plunged into another world, quite different from the ones she had been living in lately. The photographer left, and Mia did not stop being affectionate. They drank tea, for the first time in old time calmly, without swearing. Mary didn't know, didn't understand what was going on with Mia. But Mia had a plan in her head. The idea had been given to her by someone at another booze party. She didn't even remember who it was. But no matter how drunk Mia was at the moment, in the morning she woke up with one thought in her head. She had nothing to lose. She needed to act. It was quite possible that in this modern depraved world, everything would work out. Two days later, Mia brought the pictures. Mary was really beautiful in them. She looked like a child, but she was already a girl. The photographer turned out to be a true professional. The photos were stunning. Mary stayed to admire them, and Mia left. She had a second set of photos in her bag. An hour later, she had an appointment with the owner of the bank, which she had a hard time getting. Mia sat down on a bench in front of the bank building and once again went over well in her head everything she was going to say. Mia was escorted into a beautiful office. At the desk sat an elderly man. At first glance, he was about 60 years old, but if you looked closely, the man had crossed that age long ago. He looked attentively at Mia. Come in, you are very persistent. Mia stepped to the table. I have a credit in your bank, and my husband has a loan. The first one was for my husband's operation. We wanted to pay off the first one with the second, but we ran into a crook. The man wanted to say something, but Mia hurried up. No, 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 I understand that it's our own fault. My husband is already dead, and both loans are on me. I don't understand. What do you want? You want me to forgive your debt? No, I know banks don't forgive debt. I want to offer you a deal. A deal? That's very interesting. What could this woman, whose blouse was bought ten years ago, offer him? But the woman's gaze betrayed a vicious and greedy person, so the bank manager decided to listen. You understand that I will never be able to find that kind of money. This debt will be due to me for the rest of my life. And what kind of life is it, with you people following me around? They come barging into the house, and it's not profitable for you. You won't get any money anyway. And you'll only spend more when you punish me. I know that rich people have everything. Even things we may not know about. I want to sell you the girl. For the amount owed. The owner of the bank looked at her with surprised eyes. Somehow involuntarily he burst out. Why? Why? She will be your slave. Concubine. Whatever you want. Just don't let her out. That's all. I'll take care of that. I'll tell everyone that she disobeyed me, that I sent her to her aunt abroad. And that's it. No one will look for her. Mia put Mary's photographs on the table. The man took them, looked at them, and shuddered. Then began to stare then at one photo, then another. What do you think of her? She's my stepdaughter. So you want to sell your stepdaughter into slavery for the amount of the debt? Yes. He looked at her and did not understand. Was she joking, or was it serious? Then he realized there was no joke. He put the pictures in front of him. 
Go away. I'll think about it. Ninel went out, and Jack looked at the photo again. The little girl reminded him so much of his daughter. The same eye shape, the same hair. Why did you have such a life as a child? He looked at the photo for a long time and remembered. He had a daughter, his most beloved and dearest. His wife died in childbirth, so his daughter was everything to him. He was 37 when his daughter came along. He did everything for her. And she grew up and fell in love with some random con man. He told his daughter that this guy wanted one thing, her money. But she wouldn't listen. She went off with him secretly so he couldn't change anything. Jack found her three years later. Here, in the local cemetery. No one really knew anything. People said there had been an accident. Then they said she fell out the window. The crook was long gone. Jack drove here for five years, and then he moved here permanently. When everyone here realized who he was, the police got a little more talkative. His daughter had really been killed in an accident. There were even suspicions that it was the con man who set the whole thing up when he realized she wasn't going to ask her daddy for money. But until now, no one could find him. But Jack was able to. Just a year and a half later, his guys brought this pathetic shaking creature to him. Jack wanted to just bury it alive, but he started bargaining. He said he could tell him things that Jack would be very interested in, and it was about his daughter. Jack agreed to listen and promised to keep the Alphonse alive. That's when Mikhail found out that he had a granddaughter, or rather had been. She was only three months old when the accident happened. She was very sick and had been left at home that day with a neighbour. And when it happened, the bastard took her to an orphanage in the first city he could find. Jack didn't keep his word back then. For the first time in his life, he still didn't regret it. He was looking for his granddaughter, but they could not help him sincerely. The mess of paperwork finally confused the traces. But that neighbour with whom his daughter had left her granddaughter, assured him that the child was unlikely to survive. The girl was sick. She had already had a high fever for a week and was suffocating. And in an orphanage, proper care for a sick person is impossible to achieve. Jack had been beating around the bush for years, but he couldn't find any trace of the granddaughter. And he couldn't have been the girl's grandfather. But he read the papers that Mia had brought him. It had been a nice, prosperous family until the girl's mother died. He didn't really know what to do. He understood that this unpleasant woman would not pay back her debt. She would pay a penny all her life, and then she would die with the debt. And the girl would go to an orphanage, although it is unlikely she will let her go. The girl has a nice big apartment, and by the way, the apartment. Where's the guarantee this Mia won't try to kill her to get the apartment? After all, she is the next heiress. Jack didn't sleep well at night. By morning, he had made a decision. He would agree to this lady's offer, and then we would see. Mia was informed of the decision, and told that the deal had to be completed within three days. We had to figure out how to lure Mary into the oligarch's house. Mary, the photographer really liked you. She asked if you could pose for her again in some kind of photo contest. Of course, I'd be delighted. I'll take you tomorrow then. You'll have your picture taken at the new oligarch's castle. Mary goggled her eyes. She had never even dreamed that she could get behind that high fence. In the morning... Mia and Mary headed in the direction of the castle. Mary yawned. She hadn't slept well. It was five in the morning outside. Why so early? The town is still asleep. 
because it needs dawn. Mary believed it right away. She often admired pictures when it was dawn. In general, Mary thought that sunrise and sunset were the best things to photograph. The door in the high fence was open to them at once. They walked through a beautiful large room and an elderly man came out to them. Mary looked at him with all her eyes. Mia fussed, began to ask for some papers. He sat down at the table, signed something and gave it to Mia. She, without looking at Mary, rushed to the exit. Mary looked around in confusion, finally turned to the man. Excuse me. When is the photographer coming? What photographer? Well, Mia said I was invited to be photographed. No, baby. Mia sold you for debts. Mary looked at him confused. What do you mean, sold? Is there such a thing? Everything happens in our world. Sit down. Let's have breakfast. He pressed a button on the table and immediately the door opened and a man in a black suit appeared. He was carrying a tray, and after him a burly lady followed, also carrying a tray. She put the tray in front of Jack, opened the lid, Jack grumbled. Porridge. The woman pretended not to hear Jack's sighs and walked over to the girl. She opened the tray, too, and looked at her. She froze. The lid of the tray fell out of her hands. She clamped her hand over her mouth. Mary jumped up to her. Are you alright? Are you unwell? Jack watched Eva's reaction. He expected her to be surprised, but this reaction was too much. Eva, go. She wanted to say something, but he looked at her menacingly. Eva had been around ever since they had their daughter. She had been the nurse, the cook, and the helper in everything. Who better than her to remember what her beloved girl looked like? Eva was gone. She was very pale. Listen, Mary. You are a modern girl. Do you know what happens to those who are sold like you are? The girl nodded and said at once, You don't look like a monster. Thank you, of course. And how old are you? I'm fifteen. I'll be sixteen soon. Jack even shook his head. How many coincidences. His granddaughter could be that age now. Listen, let's do this. You stay with me. There's plenty of room in the house. We have to convince your stepmother that you couldn't get away from me. You can't go back anyway. She'll want to get rid of you. I'll see what I can do about it. I'll find out everything. Why? Why what? Why do you want to help me instead of reselling me, for instance? Oh, what a good idea. The girl went pale. Calm down, Mary. I'm joking. You look a lot like my daughter. So much so that Eva dropped the tray. That's why I can't get past your fate. Especially since you were sold to me. What about your daughter? Where is she? Jack was silent. He never answered such questions. No one had ever dared to ask him one. But Mary looked at him without blinking. She died a long time ago. It's happened fifteen and a half years ago somewhere in these neighborhoods. Excuse me? Mary, Eva will show you to your room. You'll be bored with me. Find something to do. You can't go outside the gate. Though they won't let you out. Jack rubbed his eyes tiredly. The more he was around this girl, the more he found similarities with his daughter. He knew he was just wishful thinking, but he couldn't help it. Mary got up and followed Eva. She had already recovered and pulled herself together. She opened the door to the room. Here, come in. The girl entered and froze. She had never seen such splendor. Eva smiled. Do you like it? Very much. It's beautiful. Don't you have any things? 
Mary smiled. No, I was sold without my things. What do you mean sold? Like this, as a slave. Eva froze. She knew her master well. This girl was talking some nonsense. Eva was already elderly, only five years younger than Jack. She had known him for a long time, but to do such a thing? Some kind of confusion in that girl's mind. But closer to lunchtime, Eva already knew the whole story. She was wiping her eyes when the girl finished her story. Mary, you don't have to worry. Mr. Davis won't do anything bad to you. And I know it. How do you know? Well, he has such good eyes. Eva showed Mary the whole house. She showed the greenhouse. Mary saw a camera hanging on the wall near the fireplace. Can I take it? Mary, be very careful. This machine is Jack's daughter's. Mary saw that the equipment was prehistoric, but she could see that it was very expensive. She looked at it, touched it. How she wanted a camera too. Always. The girl sighed and hung it up. When Jack entered the house, he almost fainted. At the window stood his daughter in her dress, twirling her camera in her hands. A second later he realised it was Mary. They sat down to dinner. Jack had already changed into his robe, and Mary noticed a strange pendant on his chest. She felt hot somehow. She did not understand why. Eva was pouring her tea, and Mary asked him, You have such a strange pendant. It doesn't look like a man's pendant. Eva gave her a warning look, but Mary smiled. It's just that I have one just like it. I thought it was girly. Eva put the kettle on the table with a clatter. Jack stood up and walked over to Mary. She looked at him frightened. Mary... Show me the pendant. The girl took off the pendant, which had always been with her for as long as she could remember. It was strange. It was semicircular on one side, and kind of torn on the other. If you took a ball of dough and tore it open, about that uneven one edge was. Jack removed his own. The two halves came together and clicked. The pendant clasped. Eva was whiter than the dishes on the table. Oh my god, what on earth is going on? Jack's heart began to ache. He slipped a pill under his tongue, called the head of security and locked himself in the office with him. Aunt Eva, did I say something wrong? Oh child, I don't understand it myself. What's going to happen now? The head of security jumped out of the chief's office with a red face. Mary saw two cars drive out of the yard. No one in the house was asleep. Somehow, without talking, everyone was sitting in the living room. Every now and again, Eva brought tea, cakes, and candy. It was as if everyone was waiting for something. Jack's phone rang. Yes, okay, I'm waiting. Silence again. Fifteen minutes later, the noise of the cars was heard. Almost immediately, the head of security entered the house, and with him a woman. She was terribly frightened. Speak. He motioned a chair for her. The woman sat down and looked at him. What? Everything you told me. I was working in an orphanage when this girl was dropped off on our porch like a puppy. She had a terrible fever and there were plenty of other illnesses. A doctor came to us from the children's hospital. She was very worried about a little girl, and then I caught her at night at the crib. The doctor was going on vacation and was very worried that the girl would not be treated as she should be. And then she turned to me and asked, is the paperwork done for her yet? And I said, no, we haven't had time. That's when she suggested it to me. I resisted at first, but then I gave up. I knew this woman. She was good, but God did not give them children. 
So she decided to secretly take the child on a vacation in some village. To stay there for a long time, and then make the girl's documents for money, as if she were her daughter. Jack asked, What was that woman's name? And the guest gave the name, surname, and even patronymic of that very doctor. Mary dropped her mug. It was her mother. <laughs>